songs that um, that uh, we don't do much anymore. And uh, it was just a, a very, very enjoyable time for us all. And um, I think we, we ended up with 30, uh, which was a good group. And I think everybody had a good time. Uh, and so thank you once again for being there. Uh, by the way, our next uh, activity that we're going to do, and this is in response to the uh, sheets, the surveys that were filled out at, uh, oh goodness, that a long time ago when Tim came down here and did the seminar for us about uh, not being swindled <laughs> uh, online, uh, that we had taken surveys to get some feedback from folks about what you would like to do and how you'd like to do it. One of the things that was mentioned was that, um, you know, could we do something during the week once? Uh, since a lot of us are retired, and um, some had wanted to go to um, Cowpens, uh, to the battleground up there. We're not going to be walking all around the trails, but uh, we'll go to the museum there. And also, by taking the bus, we can take the bus trail that goes back through, and you can see the different points for the different positions of the field uh, were for the British uh, on that side and for the American forces over here. And uh, that's interesting. Then we'll go to Strawberry Hill uh, and uh, where we'll be having our lunch. And uh, those of you who've been to Strawberry Hill know that's a, a special treat. I know it's the only place that I ever go to eat where you can order a burnt bologna sandwich. And uh, by the way, I, I recommend it. It's very good. Uh, the thick bologna, and uh, I always did like burnt bologna sandwiches. That's, uh, that's just me. But um, we'll be doing that on uh, a Tuesday, which is unusual. But once again, uh, going along with our survey, uh, Tuesday the 23rd of, of August, and we will be taking the bus for that so that we can do the little bus tour together. And uh, so if you're interested in going, there's no cost at all involved except what you want to eat when we go to Strawberry Hill. And uh, lots of times when we go to Strawberry Hill, folks want to go ahead and cross the street over there to where the big fruit market is there for, and uh, buy fresh fruits and vegetables. And so you might want to bring some money for that. But other than that, there is no cost uh, to the trip for you. And I think you will enjoy it. And it reminds us once again of the price that was paid so that we could have a country that was free and so that we could have the freedom to do what we're doing right now, which is uh, studying God's word openly and without uh, fear of the government coming and shutting us down. And so we are pr happy for that. Janet, yes. Uh, can somebody relay that message? I, even though I've got my hearing aids on, I'm still... Okay, Janet's thankful she can be here. She can't be here every Sunday, as you all know. So really glad that Janet's here, and uh, glad you uh, hope that you all you know get an opportunity to come by and say uh, hey to Janet and let her know you're praying for her. If you are, now don't lie to her, okay? But if you are, uh, be praying for Janet, and uh, we're thankful that she's able to be here with us today. Prayer request this morning before we get started. Uh, Dr. Tan, how's, how's it going with Barbara's mother? Is she still in Texas? Okay. Please continue to pray for Barbara Tan's mom. Uh, San Antonio, is that right? And, um, that, uh, and, and pray for Dr. Tan, too. I guess you're having to take care of your cooking your own meals. <laughs> well, let's pray for, pray for Dr. Tan, too, and, uh, and for Barbara. I know it's, it's hard for them right now, so 
Uh, let's, let's continue to pray for them. Anyone else? Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for another day of life. Lord, help us never to take that for granted. Lord, that we're able to get up in the morning and, and see the sunshine and we're able to appreciate all that you've given us, the birds in the, in the sky, Lord, the, the trees and the flowers and all the things, Lord, that you've done because you love us. Father, help us to love you back. Help us to love you with all our hearts. Help us to serve you with a pure heart fervently for all of our life. And Father, help us as we, many of us get toward our, our uh, later years of life to realize, Lord, that every one of these days is, is one that you've given us to be invested for your glory, to draw nigh unto thee, to love you more, and to share you with others. Father, we do pray for Dr. Tan. Uh, we ask, Lord, that you'd be with Barbara as she has to be away with her mom. And Lord, we pray for help for her and, uh, and for uh, the, the strength for her mom as well. Uh, Lord, we pray for Janet. We thank you that she's able to be here today. We pray, Father, that you would just continue to Draw close to her, Lord, and, and make her feel the sense of your presence all the time. Uh, Lord, we ask for our country today. There's so many things, Lord, that seem to be judgments, Father, falling upon our country, and I can see why. Lord, help us to have revival in America. Lord, we pray that you'd turn the hearts of our leaders. Pray, Father, that... You would help us once again to be a nation that openly stands for Jehovah God, the God who made us and preserved us a nation. And now, Father, we pray that you would be our teacher this morning as we go into the book of Luke for our final study there for this series. And just ask, Lord, that you would uh, use it to bless our hearts. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. This is the 25th week that we will have been in the book of Luke uh, since February, and uh, we have uh, uh, prepared, as we do when we get to the end of a book, I prepare a table of contents, because I do this as we go through the book. I can't give you a table of contents before we start, because I don't know what's going to be in it, or have any lessons. But this is the last lesson that we have in the book of Luke. And so if you uh, wanted a table of contents of the lessons, uh, Patty had those. I guess she offered them to you. Uh, this is what it looks like when you have all of the uh, outlines and the table of contents. And so it's pretty much a book. So uh, at any rate... Um, Thank you for uh, your diligence and, and your willingness to uh, be here and, uh, and be, take part in this study that we've had. Now, in our lesson today, we'll be looking at these subjects. Resurrection. And we see our theme verse for that, Matthew 28, 5 and 6. And the angel answered and said to the women, fear ye not. For I know that you seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. By the way, this is a verse that came to my mind when Patty and I went to the empty tomb and saw that massive stone that was there, and it was rolled away. And we poked our heads inside, and we looked around. We said, it's still empty. Amen. And so we'll talk about resurrection in this, in this chapter. Also, we'll talk about redemption. Redemption. Hebrews 9, 24 through 26. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures or pictures, types of the true, but into heaven itself, 
now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then uh, must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once, in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. The Lord presented his own blood on the altar in heaven to secure our redemption eternally from sin. We sing that hymn, once for all. And that's what it was. Jesus giving himself for us once for all. And then we'll look at release. That's another thing we'll see in this chapter. Ephesians 4, 8 through 10, and 1 Peter 3, 18 through 19. Wherefore, he saith, when he ascended up on high, Jesus, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it? But that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. So when Jesus said to the thief on the cross this day, thou shalt be with me in paradise, literally was referencing Abraham's bosom in Sheol, in the heart of the earth. For he descended first. He went there first. He tasted of Sheol for all of us. And what did he do when he was there? Well, we see that in 1 Peter. For Christ also hath once suffered for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened, made, made alive by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Well, who were those spirits in prison? David, Moses, Abraham, Lazarus, the ones that had died before, those spirits in prison, Jesus preached to and brought them with him. And so today, when a born-again believer in Jesus Christ dies, he doesn't descend. He ascends. Why? What did Paul say? To be absent from the body for a Christian is to be present where? With the Lord. Where is the Lord right now? He's in heaven at the right hand of the majesty on high. Amen? And so, what God did, with Jesus descending, he preached to the spirits there. The sacrifice has been made. The price has been paid. And you are released. And from that point on, Every person who dies in Christ goes immediately to the presence of God. And so he preached to the spirits in prison. Then next we'll look at Revelation. How he revealed himself after his resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 4 through 8. And that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me, Paul, also, as one born out of due time. So we'll talk about how he revealed himself after his resurrection in this chapter. Also, we'll look at rebuke. There's rebuke in this chapter as well. Mark 16, 14. Afterward, he appeared to the eleven as they sat at meat 
and upbraided them, that's rebuke, with their unbelief and hardness of heart. Why? Because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. We'll see that in this chapter. The women come excited because the Lord is not in that grave. He's risen. And yet, they didn't believe him. They didn't believe him. And then we'll see rejoicing. Rejoicing. John 20, 19 through 20. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. And then finally returned. Luke 24, 50 and 51. And he led them out as far as to Bethany and lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass that while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. When we were in Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives and we looked up there, I thought, I thought to myself, what an experience that must have been. To see the Lord Jesus Christ ascend right before them. What an affirmation of everything he said that he would do. No wonder they were glad. So here's our summary for chapter uh, 24. As we close our study of the book of Luke, we will consider the great events pertaining to Jesus' resurrection from the dead. His provision for our redemption, his verification to his own, his instruction for the commissioning of his church, and the glorious ascension with his promise to return. In Acts 1 3, Luke said, To whom he also showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So Jesus had died as the Lamb of God at Passover. Why? He was the Passover Lamb. He was the deliverance from the death angel, if you will. But he presented his blood to the Father in heaven for our redemption and then he released the godly souls from Sheol and then took 40 days to prepare his people for a great event at Pentecost. So sacrifice at Passover, victory at Pentecost. Pentecost, the Jewish feast of the first fruits was a celebration and thanksgiving for the harvest and the bounty of God's mercy to his people. It was observed on the 50th day after the Passover. So that would be 10 days after Christ ascended to his father. Now during that 40-day period between, he appeared in his resurrected body to Mary Magdalene, to the women at the tomb, to two men on the road to Emmaus, to the 11 disciples, more than 50 brethren at one time, James, his half-brother. Remember, James did not, uh, did not believe on Jesus during his lifetime, or during Jesus' lifetime on earth. So there was a special appearance to James after his resurrection, and James then would become a pillar in the church. And then also a special appearance to Peter that we'll talk about. In those encounters, he verified his promise to rise again. He rebuked them for their lack of faith. 
He reassured them concerning his power and plan. He opened their understanding of the scriptures. He commissioned them for the work before them. And then he told them to tarry at Jerusalem until they were endued with power from on high. So, on the day of Pentecost, that's not by accident, folks, on the day of Pentecost, first fruits, the Holy Spirit would descend upon them and empower them and send them out to preach the gospel of the resurrected Savior. The first fruits of the harvest of souls to the church would begin there. And it continues to this day. And that's our summary for chapter 24. Exciting chapter, isn't it? We better hurry or I won't get through it. So in chapter 24, we'll start with verses 1 through 3. Now, upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they, by the way, who are the they? Look up to verse 55 of the last chapter, and you'll see who the they were. And the woman also, which came with him from Galilee, followed after, and, behold, and beheld the sepulcher, and how his body was laid. And they returned back to where they were, and prepared spices and ointments, and rested on the Sabbath day according to the commandment. So it, they are the they. They came very early in the morning and came to the sepulcher bringing the spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher, and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. So as we consider the events of the resurrection day, we're presented in the four gospels with a mosaic of pieces, which I will attempt to put together to produce a chronological picture of the day itself and the period following. In this, we need to remember that the resurrected Christ had abilities that we do not possess. For example, he could obscure his appearance, appear and disappear, be where he chose to be at the speed of thought, walk through closed doors, etc. Yet, he had flesh and bones, he could eat food, and his hands and feet and side still bore the marks of his death on the cross. Luke opens this account with the women coming to the tomb and finding it empty, with the stone rolled away. Matthew 28, 1 through 4, reveals that before they arrived, an earthquake had occurred and an angel had rolled away the stone, causing the Roman guards to flee in fear. I guess I would too. But you got to remember these are Roman guards. And if they've been given a mission to guard something and they take off, guess what happens? You got it. They, they would profit their lives normally but they were so afraid of what they saw, they fled. Matthew 28, 11 through 15 says that they went to the priests. Interesting, they didn't go back to their commander, did they? No, they went to the priest that had spat on Jesus and had made fun of him and, and tried to, to make him look foolish as he hung on the cross. They went to the priests and reported this miracle to them. But their immediate response was to bribe the guards and publish a lie concerning the body. Sounds like modern politicians, doesn't it? Hey, you're not in any recession. <laughs> no, that definition Mr. Sieber taught for years in economics class of two, can, two down years in a row of uh, GDP, uh, well, our, our gross national product, GMP, uh, was the definition of recession for 
as long as I can remember. But now we've got a different uh, take on it. It's not really what you think it is, you know. That's the way these priests were. They were politicians. You know what? They should have been scared to death. But instead, they bribed the guards. And not only that, the guards said, hey, great, we got the money, but uh, what happens when they find out we, we, you tell them you slept, you were asleep. What do you think? <laughs> you know? No, if, 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 if we'll, we'll go to the governor and we'll tell him, hey, don't, leave these guys alone. They're all right. So they published a lie concerning his body. Mark 16, 9 says that Mary Magdalene was the first to reach the empty tomb. John relates an encounter she had with the Lord before he had presented his sacrificial blood to the Father. So he could not be touched at that time. That's in uh, chapter 20, verses 11 through 17. Now, <clears throat> later... Perhaps even moments later, but since Jesus was not confined to time, the ladies who had come with spices could actually touch his feet, as we saw in Matthew 28, 9. So you say, what do you, what do you mean by that? Okay, well, he, he saw Mary Magdalene. She was excited when she knew who he was, but he had to say, you can't touch me yet. Why? I have not yet ascended to the Father to make the presentation of my blood on the altar. And so he does that. You say, whoa, that must have took some time. No, he goes at the speed of what? Were you listening? At the speed of thought. <laughs> if I think myself there, I'm there. And so when he comes back, he is able to be touched on the feet by these ladies who he appears to as well. So there's no contradiction here. Verses 4 through 11. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words and returned from the sepulcher and told all these things unto the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna the Mary, uh, uh, the, and Mary, the mother of James, uh, and the other women that were with them, which told these things to the apostles. But look at the response. And their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they what? They believed them not. Don't you think they had heard the very same things that Jesus had told them, uh, the ladies earlier, about all that was going to happen? <laughs> Hello? Where were they? So the angels that had been restrained from doing anything while Jesus was on the cross, and you know they wanted to, can you picture the angels while Jesus is hanging on the cross? Let me, let me stop them from that. They're spitting on the Savior. Let me stop them from that. They couldn't. They were restrained during the time he was on the cross. But now, as they had heralded the truth of his birth to the shepherds in the fields, now they were allowed to share with these devoted women the glad tidings that Christ was risen from the dead. Triumphantly, they proclaimed, He is not here, but is risen, and reminded them that He had foretold them when they were still in Galilee that this would happen. But when they hurried to tell the apostles, their account was not believed. 
Maybe it was because they claimed to have seen angels. <laughs> uh, after all, the 11 had not seen angels. Or they failed to believe the warnings that Jesus had given them all along. Do you remember what Jesus, what Peter said to Jesus when Jesus said, you know, that he was going to have to die, or he's going to be offered up? And he said the famous words, not so, Lord. You don't tell Jesus Christ not so and then call him Lord. No, he's Lord. And it is so. So they didn't necessarily believe the warnings Jesus had given them all along concerning his resurrection. Or maybe it was just the idea that all of this was just too good to be true. Let's go on and look at verse 12 by itself. Then arose Peter and ran unto the sepulcher, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves and departed, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. And so we see also here in a companion scripture, which we will actually read, John chapter 20, verses 2 through 9 give us this same account. John chapter 20, 2 through 9. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, under the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth, and cometh to Simon Peter, and the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulcher. Now, who is that other disciple? John. <laughs> okay, it's John. And by the way, he, he wants you to know that he won the foot race, by the way. I thought that was interesting. Verse 4. So they both ran both together, and the other disciple, John, did outrun Peter. <laughs> And came first to the sepulcher. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet he went not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and seeing the linen clothes lying. Can you see the difference in personalities here? I mean, John looks, Peter rushes in. That's Peter. And the napkin that was about his head not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which first came to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Whoa! So, what we see here then is when Mary Magdalene reported the empty tomb to Peter and John, they ran to find the story to be true. And entering the sepulcher, Peter found the linen grave clothes folded with the napkin that had covered his head, but Jesus was not there. John gives the impression that at that point, the disciples had not really understood the significance of Psalm 16, 10, which says... For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Later on, Peter will use that very scripture when he brings the message and 3,000 people are saved. But apparently at that time, uh, they were beholden from it. Verses 13 through 31, and by the way, that should say 13, not 14, Uh, I made a miscue. Back in Luke. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs. And they talked together of all those things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. You say, what do you mean by that? Jesus can do that. 
I mean, you remember back when uh, uh, Elisha and his servant were surrounded by the armies uh, and, and uh, his servant was so scared and Elisha said, uh, Lord, open his eyes. And he opened his eyes and he saw the host of heaven surrounding the army that was surrounding them. See, there are things we can't see, folks. And, and Jesus could withhold his identity from them for the time. And he said unto them, what manner of communications are these that ye have one with another as you walk and are sad? And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering said, and said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast thou not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty indeed and in word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death, and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which had have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels which said that he was alive. And certain of them uh, which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh into the village, whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us. For it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and brake it, and gave to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him. Well, then what happens? And he vanished out of their sight. I don't mean he said, oh, excuse me, I've got to go to the men's room. He vanished out of their sight. So Mark, by the way, makes a brief reference to this Resurrection Day encounter on the road to Emmaus. But Luke relates it in such detail that some have guessed that he was the unnamed companion of Cleopas who met the Lord on the road to Emmaus. I don't necessarily think he was, but some have thought so because Luke told so much about this encounter. By his omnipotence, Jesus was able to walk with these men who obviously had been his followers and to keep his identity unknown to them. Their sad countenances and earnest conversation made it plain that the two were in a state of bewilderment as Jesus came near them. Now, Cleopas, who was Jesus' uncle by marriage, uh, you, did you know that? Uh, Cleopas, if you go back and look at John 19, 25, we don't have time to chase that rabbit, but uh, he was actually the husband of the Mary that was, um, was uh, with the women at the sepulcher, uh, which you find there. So literally, he should have known him. <laughs> he was his follower. He was also his uncle by marriage. 
And doubtless he had heard from his wife the details related during the conversation, which he referred to as certain women, also of our company, made us astonished. They believed Jesus to be the Messiah, but didn't understand or detect the meaning of the prophecies given in the scriptures concerning him. For instance, Daniel 9.26, which said Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. Isaiah 53, which gives a graphic description of what he would suffer. Psalm 22, which is a picture of Christ hanging on the cross, had made it clear that Christ would suffer and die and enter into his glory. As they walked on, Jesus took the time to open their eyes to all the scriptures from Moses through the prophets that revealed his identity. By the way, this is, was a great lesson to us as well, that we should look diligently to study his word so that he might reveal himself to us through his word. Reaching their de destination, the men asked Jesus to stay and sup with them. And at that meal, Jesus himself revealed himself, then vanished out of their sight. Verses 32 through 35, as we continue. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way? And when he opened to us the scriptures, and they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them saying, the Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared unto Simon. And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in the breaking of bread. So excitedly, they immediately returned to Jerusalem to tell the eleven that they had seen the resurrected Christ. They had sensed his presence even as they walked with him and listened while he gave them the word of God to answer all their questions and dissolve their doubts. They were bewildered. He used the word of God to show them they didn't need to be bewildered. However, their witness was not believed. Mark 16, 13 says, And they went and told it to the residue. Neither believed they them. Now this makes it obvious that these fearful, doubt-filled men were certainly in no condition to carry out a plot to steal Jesus' body and claim that he had risen from the dead. The group they reported to, referred to as the eleven, and them that were with them, apparently did not include Simon, since he is referenced here. The term the eleven is the group of Jesus' disciples. This becomes obvious in the next passage, where Jesus himself appears and reveals his body to the group, and Thomas was the, not there to see it. Now you say, well, well, why do they call it the 11? Well, let's say we had a deacon's meeting. And so at the deacon's meeting, uh, we had, well, we've got, what, eight deacons? Let's say we had six deacons there because two had to be out of town. All right, we would come back and we'd say, uh, well, we went to the, de the deacon's meeting, okay? Well, there's the deacon's meeting. They're the deacons. The 11 were the 11 disciples except for Judas, and so they were a group, but not all of them were there, okay? They're simply referred to as the 11 at this point. Luke does not give the details of all the contacts Jesus made during the 40 days prior to his ascension. Although he does allude to them in Acts chapter 1 verse 3. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So as we go on, verses 36 through 44, 
and we'll use a companion scripture here from John 20 again. So let's go on to verses 36 through 44. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are you troubled? And why do your thoughts arise in your hearts? Why are you scared, in other words? Behold, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as you see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have you here any meat? Now, by the way, I don't know that Jesus was really hungry, but he was trying to make a point, wasn't he? Hey, yeah, I have a physical body. I can eat. And they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and of a honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before them. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Now, before we do our summation, let's turn back to John chapter 20, verses 19 through 29 for the rest of the story, if you will. Starting in verse 19. And the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus unto them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. Whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. By the way, this is just like he said in Matthew 16, verse 19. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples, therefore, said unto him, later of course, we have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. That's why we call him Doubting Thomas. And after eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. And he saith to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. So in these two remarkable passages of Scripture, we view two visits by the resurrected Lord with his disciples. At the first encounter, they thought him to be a ghost and were afraid. They had had the same reaction, by the way, before, when he had uh, come to them walking on the sea, if you'll remember, thought it was a spirit. Jesus bade them to be at peace and showed them his hands and his feet, still bearing the marks of his crucifixion. He assured them that he had flesh and bones, could eat food, and therefore was not a spirit. By the way, we'll have spiritual bodies like that too. Can you imagine that? 
being able to walk through doors, travel at the speed of thought. He said, when we see him, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So he had a physical body. Then he reminded them that what they saw before them was exactly what he had said beforehand he would do. Additionally, he pointed out that all these things had been prophesied in the scriptures of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. In John's account, Jesus had come through shut doors. Another reason he was mistaken for a spirit. And calling them to peace, he conferred upon them the power of the Holy Spirit to discern the truths of the Word of God. And I believe, I believe that's exactly what this was. And he commissioned them to go out in his name and preach salvation and the forgiveness of sins. However, at this appearance, Thomas was not there to witness it and would not believe until Jesus appeared again the next week. At this encounter, when Jesus offered Thomas to examine his wounds and believe, Thomas fell down and worshipped him, saying, My Lord and my God. Now, this is important to remember. You know, these people that want to come around and tell you that Jesus never claimed to be God? I'll read their Bible. Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Now, if Jesus was not Lord and God, what should he have done? He should have done what the, the messenger to John did in the book of Revelation, verse 22, 8 and 9, where when John fell down to worship him, he said, no, you don't worship me. I'm not God. So if Jesus was not God, he should not have received the worship of Thomas as God. But Jesus acknowledged the rightful worship, confirming his deity. He said, Thomas, you've seen and you believe. But it's more blessed because God is pleased by faith. For those who have not seen and yet believe. Verses 45 through 49. Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the scriptures. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. By the way, what is that promise of the Father? The indwelling Holy Spirit. He's with you and shall be what? In you. That's what he's talking about here, the promise of the Father. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem till you be endued with power from on high. So in this passage, Luke uses the term, open their understanding, in the same way John meant when he said Jesus breathed on them the Holy Ghost. The result was that they now understood the meanings of the message given in the scriptures and in the life of Jesus Christ. And they were to be his witnesses to spread the gospel to all nations, not just the Jews. However, they were to tarry in Jerusalem and await the promise of the Father, which would be the indwelling Holy Spirit, who would empower and teach and guide and direct and seal them to the day of redemption. We're going to go to John for one last uh, portion of this uh, study, because it's only in John that we're given... Uh, this uh, portion of scripture, which uh, describes the time when Christ met his disciples at the Sea of Galilee. So that is in John chapter 21, verse 1 to, through 23. We'll have to do it quickly. So I'm running out of time. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, 
On this wise he showed himself. There were together Simon Peter, and Thomas, called Didymus, and Nathaniel, Cana, and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, James and John, the two other disciples. Simon Peter said unto them, I go a fishing. And they said unto him, We go also with thee. They went forth, entered into a ship immediately, and that night caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast on the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it in for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved, alias who? John, <laughs> right? Saith unto Peter, it's the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he heard on his fisher's coat unto him, for he's naked, and he cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as far as it was 200 cubits, dragging the net with fishes. And as soon as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon, and bread. Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which you have caught. Simon Peter went up and he drew the net to the land full of great fishes, a hundred and fifty-three. And for all, there were so many, yet was the net not broken. Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou? Knowing it was the Lord. Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them fish likewise. This now was the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. And you know the rest of the story, how that Christ took Peter aside, asked him three times, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than thee? Yea, Lord, thou knowest I love thee. And what did Jesus tell him to do? Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. So, at some point during the 40 days after his resurrection, Peter had taken six of the disciples with him to return to his fishing business. Now, apparently, he had not understood the command of the Great Commission to forsake those things in order to preach the gospel of Christ. Or he doubted God's ability to meet the physical needs of him and his family. But after a night of fruitless fishing by the disciples, Jesus stood on the shore in the morning and told them, and that should say where, they could find fish. Then he invited them to come and dine on the breakfast that he had already prepared for them. The message here was obvious. God will supply all your needs if you only trust in Him. But without Him, you can do what? You can fish all night and catch how many fish? Zero. Peter especially was given a commission personally by Jesus there. Feed my sheep. And we close with verses 50 through 53. We close the book of Luke. And he led them out as far as to Bethany and lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were, and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. So on the 40th day, 10 days before Pentecost, Jesus led his disciples as far as Bethany on the Mount of Olives, blessed them, and he ascended up to his Father, just as Hebrews 12, 5 said that he would be caught up to the Father. As instructed, the disciples returned to Jerusalem where they waited in prayer and praise joyfully. Ten days later, the upper room on the day of Pentecost, would see the Holy Ghost come down as cloven tongues of fire and 
set up on each of the 120 assembled there to indwell them all and empower his church to fulfill his plan. The book of Luke has been such a blessing. But here is the crowning portion. Our Lord returned to heaven, seated at the right hand of the majesty on high, making intercession for who? Me, you, those who have believed and trusted in him every day. Why? Because our accuser, Satan, day and night, Accuses us before God. All Jesus has to do is show his hands and his feet. Father, forgive them. And we're pardoned. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word, for it is rich. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to apply it to our hearts. Lord, that we might continue to carry the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not just his death and burial, but gloriously his resurrection. And the resurrection that you promised to us who trust you as well. In Jesus' name, amen. By the way, I had said earlier that we'd be going into a study of the book of Daniel right after Luke. But uh, in order to try to kind of coordinate with what everybody else is doing in the adult Sunday school classes, um, we will be starting that study a little bit later. Um, and instead, in the next uh, few Sundays, we'll be looking at the topic, 10 Views of the Cross. It'll be a little bit different study but you'll be seeing 10 views of the cross of Jesus Christ. And that will be what we'll be studying between now and when we go into the book of Daniel. Okay? And if any of you would like to get any of these outlines that you have not gotten, if you'll let uh, myself or Patty know, we'll be glad to help you with that. Thank you. You are dismissed.